So are there any questions before we start in on the final part of chapter four? Okay. We're talking about vision and <clears throat> you'll recall from last time that light enters the eye and there it meets the curved corneal surface where there's a lot of focusing going on. Passes through the pupil whose size is regulated by the iris and the light then hits this lens and it turns out in younger people age 45 or less, isn't it amazing that I can call somebody who's age 44 younger? Anyway, uh, a younger person, 44 or less I should say, uh, their lens changes shape and if it is sort of thinner, thinner or elongated then it has less focusing power. If it is fatter and sort of shrunk in its size then it has more focusing power. So uh, this change in the lens shape helps accommodate to viewing things at near distances or at far distances. Uh, we get a focused picture of the world hopefully falling on the retina and here's uh, the retina at the back of the eye and again we have uh, layers in the retina and I think of these as having sort of uh, uh, cells uh, that are photoreceptors, rods and cones and then cells uh, that transmit information from the rods and cones to the ganglion cells and those are the bipolar cells and then here are the ganglion cells themselves. In addition we have horizontal and amacrine cells that are helping to spread information laterally from uh, say uh, over here to over here. So what we're going to talk about now is how light is transduced by photoreceptors and we're going to focus in particularly on rods. So let's say we have a, a rod, we know that it has a, an outer segment and the outer segment of a rod is the rod shaped thing where we find photopigment molecules. And the photopigment molecules in rods, well it's rhodopsin, that's the name of that molecule and when you translate it it's visual purple and it is a photopigment. It's good at absorbing photons in the range of visible light wavelengths which would be 400 through 700 nanometers and it's actually a molecule that combines retinal which is a smaller molecule like vitamin A and opsin which is a genetically coded protein. So those two things together make rhodopsin and it turns out that these rhodopsin molecules are embedded in disc membranes in the outer segment. So here's a look over here now at the right at the outer segment and you can see that there are these discs sort of piled on top of one another, a stack of discs and if we look at a single one of the discs we will find this uh, membrane is surface and embedded there we'll find rhodopsin molecules indicated by the purple things here and again each rhodopsin molecule is actually made of two things. Retinal which is like vitamin A and you can see it right here embedded inside the opsin uh, which is the genetically coded protein. So we have a rhodopsin molecule with those two parts embedded in the membranes of these uh, uh, discs. So. Uh, how does this help uh, with seeing light? Well, it turns out that retinal changes shape when it absorbs a photon of light and that is going to initiate a chain of events that leads to a change in polarization of the photoreceptor that can then uh, result in a nervous system signal. So uh, when we have our retinal that's hanging out by itself, it's in what's known as this cis conformation and if we now have a photon of light hitting this molecule and being absorbed, well it's going to change shape right there at this uh, link it's going to straighten out and become uh, the all trans configuration and that's the change in shape. So it's sort of bent, it absorbs light, it becomes straight and this uh, is sensed effectively by the surrounding uh, opsin and leads to a chain of interesting events. So what are these events? I have this really complicated diagram and I don't know what it's worth. When I look at diagrams like this I say, do I really need to know this? And I say, well, no I don't really need to know it. Is this a good way to learn what's happening? I don't know if it's the best way to learn. I have a better way in just a moment. But you, basically what's going on is you can see here's a photon absorbed by a rhodopsin molecule and there's all sorts of uh, biochemistry going on here but one result 
uh, is that we have this impact on GTP, which apparently has an impact on phosphodiesterase uh, enzyme molecules, which in turn has an impact on cyclic GMP and GTP things, which in turn has an impact on ion channels in the cell membrane. And we have to remember ion channels in the cell membrane are what cause changes in polarization. Normally there's an excess of positive ions out there, so if we open ion channels, the positive guys go in. If we close those channels, then, well, there are pumps that pump the positive ions back out. Uh, so effectively there's a link between the absorption of the photon and these ion channels. And we have a nice little movie that shows this pretty nicely. So what I'm going to do is jump to this movie, and this movie is right here. Is that good? Yeah. So we're going to play this. <laughs> Good, it's looping because that was too fast. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to point out that at the moment that ion channel is, oh, it just closed. Let's see what happens when it opens. When that ion channel is open, these guys are going into the cell. What are those guys? Those are the ions, the positively charged sodium and calcium ions. So when this thing is open, there they go. It looks as though cyclic GMP, guanosine monophosphate molecules, are helping keep that thing open. Uh, see, they're hanging out there keeping that channel open. And during that state, the inside of the cell will be relatively depolarized or more positive because we're having positive ions enter the cell. Now, that's uh, a channel that we're going to close. How does it close? Well, we're going to absorb a photon. There it is, bing. Did you see that little light come in? That was the photon. So here it comes. Hello, there it is. Okay, so we absorb light right there and then what happens, uh, if we can follow this through, is that we have a chain of biochemical events that result in effectively the transformation of cyclic GMP molecules. Here they are, they're going to hit this phosphodiesterase there and turn into guanosine monophosphate, GMP molecules. And the GMP molecules by themselves are not going to keep that ion channel open, so it closes. So the open channel, there it is, kept open by CGMP, is going to close because the cyclic GMPs are going to be transformed into normal GMPs by the activity of this guy. And that guy is made active because we've absorbed a photon of light. So that's a little bit better than that previous diagram. I hope you'll agree. So let's see, let me put this away and go back to the PowerPoint, PowerPoint. So the upshot of this is that in the dark, membrane ion channels are open because of the presence of those cyclic GMP molecules. And that means that the positively charged ions are entering the cell in the dark. So the cell is relatively depolarized in the dark. And the result of that, as usual, is that synaptic transmitter is released by the rod in the dark. Now what happens when we shine a light on that rod? Well, photons are absorbed and the rhodopsin molecule has a part, the retinal component, that changes shape and it causes membrane ion channels to close. So the rod itself becomes hyperpolarized and the transmitter molecules, the neurotransmitter molecules, are no longer released. So effectively, uh, it's a little bit backwards to what we think might happen. You might say, well, if we shine light on a rod, it's going to depolarize and release transmitter. No, in fact, it's the opposite. When the rod is in the dark, it is depolarized and releasing transmitter. It's so when we shine a light on it uh, that it does the reverse, hyperpolarize and stop signaling. So in this particular diagram, you can see that clearly. This little plot is a light pulse, the amount of light as time passes along the horizontal axis. And if we look at the uh, resting potential, uh, which is effectively uh, a record of the electrical activity, uh, we can see that the membrane potential decreases, so it hyperpolarizes in response to that light pulse. And that hyperpolarization causes less neurotransmitter to be released. So yet again, rods in the dark uh, 
are associated with the activity of cyclic GMP keeping the channels open and rods in the light are uh, associated with uh, more or less inactivity of cyclic GMP. It's getting converted to guanosine monophosphate and channels are closed. And I'm hitting all the wrong buttons just at the right time. There we go. So that's a sort of look at this thing. If you take a course in, say, sensation and perception, how many people have taken a course in sensation and perception? How many people are looking forward to taking a course? You can learn more details about this sort of thing. Uh, a course in neurobiology or other aspects of neuroscience might also cover this in more detail. What is the, well, what are the basic sciences that you've got to be pretty good at to work in this field? What do you suppose would be one of the key ingredients? While we're talking about all these molecules and we're talking about recording electric events, it seems to me that chemistry and physics would be really, really important to know in detail uh, to try to figure this sort of stuff out. So I, I'm recommending that people, if they have the opportunity, please continue your education in the basic sciences because that will help tremendously uh, with understanding and working on material of this sort. Ah, yeah, well, light and dark adaptation are very important phenomena that help adjust the sensitivity of our visual systems to the ambient amount of light. And one of the things we touched on briefly already, when the amount of light uh, decreases uh, a lot, say we step into a dark movie theater and we have trouble seeing, we step on people's toes, we say, oops, sorry. Uh, well, what's happening is that the rods are increasing their sensitivity uh, so that they will provide functioning vision after five or ten minutes pass. And the cones, of course, aren't working at all because there's not enough light. So effectively, you're getting an increase in rod sensitivity. If you turn the lights out all the way so there's no light in a room, it can take 20 to 30 minutes for rods to reach their full sensitivity. But a lot of that is reached within five or ten minutes. People are probably familiar with the fact when you go to a movie theater that, you know, when you walk in it, it is dark and you are stepping on a person's foot. But after ten minutes, you can see everything. People have noticed that, right? Your rods are getting more sensitive. So you need to dark adapt in a dark environment. Similarly, if you come out of the movie theater, everything tends to be a little bit bright. Well, that's called light adaptation. And now the cones are adjusting so that they can help you see uh, things more clearly at those light levels. Good question. That is the sort of thing you'd see covered in a course on sensation and perception. Now, uh, so this is where uh, we're going. We're trying to transmit the information now from the rods and the cones. It turns out that the cones also have photopigments and they also are capable of absorbing photons and signaling uh, that event in much the same way that we find with the rods. So these guys are sending signals uh, directly to the bipolars and then to the ganglion cells and the axons of the ganglion cells travel up the optic nerve into our brains. And we now want to look at those pathways briefly. Uh, turns out that the immediate destination of the overwhelming majority of ganglion cell axons uh, is the lateral geniculate nucleus. And there it is written. And here they are diagrammatically. There's one of them on the left side of the brain. There's the other on the right side of the brain. So we have two of these nuclei, one per hemisphere. And it turns out that if you look at the neurons in this sensory way station on the left and on the right, well, it turns out uh, that they respond to events in their opposite sides visual field. And I mentioned this earlier. Uh, so if I am looking straight ahead and I wave my hand over on the left, then I can be certain it is the neurons in my right lateral geniculate nucleus that are responding best. Likewise, if I start moving my hand over here on the right side of the visual field, it is the neurons in the left lateral geniculate nucleus that are responding best. Now for this to be true, it turns out uh, that certain axons have to cross and go to the other side of the brain. So. Let me see if I can explain this. In fact, it's also on the next side, so maybe I'll leave it to there. Uh, some optic nerve fibers must cross sides. Now, show this in just a moment. Let me point out, though, that the 
axons of neurons in the LGN project primarily to uh, primary visual cortex, area V1 at the back of the brain. We talked about this before. So this is the uh, sort of uh, probably uh, greatest uh, way in which visual, uh, visual information is transmitted up into the brain via this pathway. The important thing is that there are some retinal ganglion cells that send their axons to other locations. For example, there are retinal ganglion cells that send their axons to the superior colliculus, which is in the midbrain, and there are also uh, ganglion cells that send their axons to uh, areas in the brain associated with circadian rhythms. And it turns out that some of these cells do not have the standard rod or cone sensitivities to light, rather they're more like melanin, a sort of brown pigment in the skin. And there's a small number of these cells that have axons that travel to centers in the brain associated with circadian rhythms, and the belief is that they are signaling the absolute amount of light. So is it nighttime, in which case these guys would be responding very weakly, or is it daytime where there's much more light available, in which case they're responding, responding much more strongly. So in addition to these neurons that we're considering right now, uh, there are a couple of other systems. And uh, I just wanted to point that out. Now let's see. Here we go. It turns out that some of the axons from the retinal ganglion cells in the left eye and in the right eye must cross over so that we have the left side of the visual field represented on the right side of the brain and vice versa. And you can sort of figure out what's going to happen. So I'm covering one eye, make this simpler. It turns out that this eye of mine is able to see both that side of the visual field and that side of the visual field, at least insofar as my nose doesn't block it. So I can see on that side of the visual field and that side of the visual field. Now if we want a true contralateral representation, we've got to send, hmm, the retinal ganglion cell axons that are responding here over to that side of the brain. And we've got to keep the retinal ganglion cells that are responding over here on the same side of the brain. So some of those axons have got to cross. And if you try the other eye, it's the same deal. I mean, so for instance, all of the axons that are responding to the waving of my hand over on that side of the visual field, all of those axons must cross sides. Uh, all of the ones that are seeing over here though, they're fine. They're already on the correct side. So do you see that some of the fibers have to cross? And they do in both of the diagrams that we've had here. Here's our second diagram. You can see them crossing and that is known as the optic decussation where uh, the fibers cross in the optic nerve so that we have this contralateral organization, uh, contralateral processing of visual information. And here we have, uh, let's see, uh, lateral geniculate nuclei. Uh, in the thalamus. Here we have uh, superior colliculi, inferior colliculi, and I think this is medial geniculate nucleus. We have other areas shown there. Uh, but the important point is that we have a major projection from lateral geniculate nucleus to primary visual cortex on either side of the brain. Good. Now, what are all these neurons doing? <laughs> Good question. While well, the people have devoted their lives to figuring out visual processing and there are two main effects uh, that are probably uh, most important to think about and they all derive from one principle and that principle is if something is not changing, if something is just staying the same, then we'd have to agree that that's pretty boring, right? You just say, yeah, it's the same as it's always been, same old, same old, you know. Visual system was not designed to report same old, same old. It was designed to report things that are changing. It's designed to impart information about, well, how lights vary as we move from one point in the visual field to the next, how lights are varying as we change their spectral properties from, say, the 400 nanometer blues to the 700 nanometer reds. So uh, what I want to talk about is basically the visual system's emphasis on things that are changing in the visual stimulus, both spatially and uh, after we finish this section, in color as well. So we'll talk first about uh, 
spatial contrast effects and spatial opponency. And the idea here is that the visual system is bored by things that don't change. It likes to emphasize what is changing. And when you think about light levels, say you move from this position over to that position and you compare the light levels, well, it might be darker over here and lighter over here. That is a change. The visual system is interested and it turns out that it emphasizes that change in perception. So it accentuates edges. And we'll see some examples of that shortly, including mock bands. So people have developed models of how the visual system processes visual information in a way that emphasizes or accentuates those edges. And lateral inhibition is one term uh, that people have come up with to describe the comparison of information found at two or more different points in the visual field. So if I want to compare the light level here to the light level there, while these two points are side by side, I need to compare those light levels and people use the term lateral inhibition for that comparison. They also use the term spatial opponency. They also use the term center surround processing. There are a variety of terms to describe the same phenomenon, but the underlying idea is clear. We want to find out what changes between one point and the next. Uh, so. I saw a question. Repeat the comparison. No, it's, it started with comparison. And you started oh, yeah, well, sure. What we're concerned with now with spatial potency, <coughs> excuse me, is a comparison of light levels. Say the simplest example is two locations, here and there. And it may well be the case that these are different light levels, so darker here and brighter there. Uh, and it turns out that the visual system is interested in that difference. It emphasizes that difference. It accentuates it. And that accentuation goes by several names, including lateral inhibition, spatial opponency, uh, center surround organization, things along those lines. And that's what we're going to talk about. Uh, so to prove to ourselves that the uh, visual system is accentuating differences, let's consider this very famous visual illusion of simultaneous contrast. And what we have here is a uh, white background on the left in this gray disk and then a black background on the right. And it turns out that from the physical point of view, this is the exact same gray on the right as it is on the left. So when you make these pictures, you just make the left disk gray equal to the right disk gray. Now the question is, do they look the same? No. Hopefully they do not look the same to you. If they do look the same to you, then well, something's a little bit odd. Most people would agree uh, that this one looks a little bit darker on the left and this gray disc on the right looks a little bit brighter. Do people see that? Good. Now that's the basic illusion and we want to understand why that might be the case. So again, what we want to do is think about the visual system comparing light levels at nearby locations and emphasizing differences. So let's try the left. With this gray disc on the left, uh, we have a light level that is being compared to the surrounding white. So the basic comparison of light level on the left is this brighter white and the darker gray. And if we are going to accentuate that uh, difference, then we're going to make this darker still in the way that it appears. So the disc at left is darker than the surrounding white area. So by contrast, it looks darker even more. Does that make sense? We accentuate that darkness. What about the right side? Same deal. Uh, it's the same physical gray, but it ends up looking lighter. Why? Because it's now being compared to the black background. And relative to this black background, that gray disc is a bright thing. So the disc at right is lighter than the surrounding black area. So we could say by contrast, the disc at right ends up looking even lighter. So this, by contrast, ended up looking darker. Uh, on the right, by contrast, it ended up looking lighter. And that accounts for the illusion. Now, that's a bunch of words. And so people have tried to develop models that are, that are somewhat more precise in accounting for this sort of illusion. 
and they say, well, we must have neurons that compare photoreceptor responses at different image locations. For instance, we have to have some neurons looking at the gray disc on the left and some neurons uh, looking at the surrounding white and ditto for the thing on the right here, looking at this gray on the right and the surrounding black. So we need neurons at these locations and we need to compare their responses. What might that look like? Well, we're going to get there shortly. A couple more fun visual illusions. Most people call these what? What do people call this visual illusion? Most people call it mock bands. That turns out to be uh, inaccurate. These are actually chevrule stripes after the fellow who is a textile maker discovered them. He wanted to make nice looking textiles with stripes but instead, instead perceived irregularities in the stripes appearance. And this guy's name was chevrule so these are chevrule stripes. So when we look from this black stripe over on the left up through these other stripes to the white one on the right, well the physical stimulus is effectively uh, sort of like a staircase. The light intensity level within each of these bars is identical and it increases as we go from the left side of the picture to the right side of the picture. If we choose one of these bars, however, let's say uh, this one, the fifth from the left, most people would agree that it appears to be darker on its left, excuse me, its right boundary right here and it appears to be lighter on its left boundary over here. How many people see that? Good and I think you'll see it in the other bars as well. So I can come way over here on the second one from the left and I'd say yeah it's definitely a little bit darker on its right side and a little bit lighter on its left side and that's also true way over here on the right. So yeah that's the chevrule illusion and again we want to know how that could be occurring. And you have to think about the visual system comparing light levels. So let's go back to this middle bar again. Uh, we have a gray that when it's on the right side of the bar is being compared to something that is brighter. So this gray here gets compared to that gray which is more intense. So this gray by contrast ends up looking darker. What about the left hand side of that same bar? Well, it's getting compared to gray value that is darker in the adjacent bar and so by contrast it ends up looking lighter. So the same sort of reasoning is suggesting why on the left it looks lighter and on the right it looks darker. It's because we're comparing gray levels to the adjacent bars gray levels. This finally is a mock band and you can see how the light intensity varies over on the left. It's a flat white. Then we have a ramp taking that white down to black as we move to the right and then we have a bunch of black. So if we were to think about what this stimulus might look, at, uh, look like, we would probably miss the fact that it has a brightening right around here. And this is something that depends on viewing distance. But most people agree that for this stimulus there's a little bit of brightening right about that location. Do people see that? Good. And there's a little bit of darkening right at that location. So if we were to describe the way it looks, it's sort of fine, 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 fine sort of a too much brightness right there then it comes down then there's too much darkness here and then it flattens out again. So what we see does not match exactly what's being presented to us. And again it's thought that this is a process of comparing uh, visual stimulation at adjacent points that is accounting for this. Uh, okay. So here we go. What we're going to do is now compare light levels at adjacent points and try to understand how it is the visual system emphasizes change, how it emphasizes edges. Uh, so here is our simple visual stimulus. As we move from the left side to the right side, we have a uh, sort of a uniform white card and then on the right side a uniform black card. And if we were to plot the light intensity as we move from the left side of that stimulus over to the right side, we would say, well, it's higher, then it's lower. So that would be this step from the higher light intensity down to the lower light intensity. And we want to see if there's some, uh, 
way of processing that gives rise to uh, observed perceptual phenomena. And yes, uh, spatial opponency or comparison of light levels at adjacent locations can account for this. So be patient with these diagrams. This is our stimulus. It's the white card on the left and then the black card on the right. And uh, we're going to assume that that black was worth 100 units of light intensity and the white is actually 200 units of light intensity. So light intensity 200 on the left, 100 on the right. So does that make sense so far? Bright, dark. Now what we're going to say is that the responses of the photoreceptors are effectively the same as the brightness of the lights, the intensities of the lights that are shining on them because I do not want to talk about the units of rod response or anything like that. So I'm simply going to say that when, when we have a rod looking at the left half of our stimulus, it's going to respond 200, whatever 200 might be. When we have a rod that's looking at the right side of our stimulus, while well, it's seeing this uh, black part, and it's only going to respond 100. So the photoreceptor response is in effect made uh, identical uh, to the light intensity for purposes of explanation. So this rod says 200, this guy says 200, 200, 200. These guys over on the right, they say 100, 100, 100, 100. These are the inputs to a further layer of cells that compare photoreceptoral responses. So here is that further layer of cells and these are center surround opponent units. And you can think of these as bipolar cells in the retina or ganglion cells uh, if you like. Let's see what happens. What we have is a cell that does a simple computation, a simple comparison. It's represented by that plus sign. It's going to add up three inputs. So here's a cell, that plus sign, it adds up three inputs and it turns out that the photoreceptor in the center, that's this guy here, is worth one when it comes to the activity of this center surround opponent unit. And what that means is we will take the photoreceptor response 100, we will multiply it by one and so that's worth positive 100 units of stimulation for this center surround opponent unit. Now the thing is we're doing a comparison. We're looking for differences and the word difference suggests that we are subtracting something. What are we subtracting? We're subtracting the inputs from the photoreceptors on either side of that central unit. So here's that same center surround opponent unit and now we have on the left side this photoreceptor, its response is 100 but it gets multiplied by minus a half and that means in effect it's being subtracted and this guy on the right is also off to the side. It pro provides a response of 100 but it gets multiplied by minus one half and so it also ends up getting subtracted. Now what I want you to do mentally is add up the inputs to this center surround opponent unit. Well, the center, 100 units of uh, input times plus one equals 100 units of stimulation. But the two surrounds are providing, well, minus 50 from the left and minus 50 from the right. So plus 100, minus 50, minus 50 adds up to zero. The response of this cell is zero. And the important thing is that when you show a cell like this something that has no change whatsoever, it doesn't respond. This cell hates looking at nothingness. It needs change to be excited. It's got to be something getting brighter or something getting darker. If it's looking at just a whole bunch of blackness, hey, the response of that cell is zero. There are cells over here, if they're looking at just a whole bunch of whiteness, well, they're bored. There is no change on the left side of that stimulus. They're also responding zero. The sort of cells uh, that respond are the cells that are positioned at edges. So here we have a cell here represented by that second plus sign and you can see that two of its photoreceptors are looking at the bright side of our stimulus on the left and that one photoreceptor here on the right is looking at the right side of the stimulus. So the levels of stimulation provided uh, to this neuron are different and it turns out we will get a response that is not zero. So in detail, this central neuron 
uh, excuse me, the central photoreceptor provides an input of 200. It gets multiplied by 1 and that's worth plus 200 uh, units of stimulation. Now this guy in the left also gets uh, 200 uh, times minus a half is minus 100. And this guy over here is 100 units of stimulation times minus a half, that's minus 50. And if you add those three numbers up, you're now getting a positive response, plus 50. So the same wiring diagram, which is plus one excitation in the center and minus a half inhibition for the left and right surrounding units, well, that same thing in this position and in that position do different things. Here, we're looking at an edge. So we get a nice response. Here we're looking at something that's not changing in its light level. So we get zero response. So it's this sort of model that people rely on uh, when they start accounting for things like uh, simultaneous contrast. Let's take a couple more examples. What we want to do is effectively say there is a layer of cells uh, at each position in the retina performing these comparisons. So here are two further example cells. This particular cell here, that plus sign, again, it's excited by input from the central photoreceptor, that's the multiplication by plus one, and it's inhibited by inputs from the left and right surrounding photoreceptors, that's the minus a half. And it turns out when that neuron is looking at something where there's no change in the light level, it has zero response. This guy over here, it has the same organization but it's looking at the edge so there is now a response. If we were to plot the response of these center surround units as we move from left to right across our picture, we would find, well, that part of the picture is very boring as far as our center surround units go, the response is zero. But when we come to that edge, yeah, we're getting all sorts of things happening there. Uh, the centers around neurons like the edge, they respond to it. But when we're back over here looking at just uh, the dark side of the picture, again the response is zero because there's no more change. So we see a hefty response to the edge, the edge is accentuated, we see no response whatsoever uh, to these uh, dull parts. So people rely on neurons like this to account for uh, the accentuation of spatial change or spatial opponency by the visual system. <laughs> Is it on the exam? No. No worries. Uh, okay, so I was trying to present in the previous slides sort of the left to right version of these models. So we're trying to keep it simple. It's a one dimensional account that we had, but most people uh, we need to move to two dimensions because the retina, in, flat, in fact, at the back of the eye is sort of a two-dimensional surface. And what it's doing is comparing light levels found not only uh, in some central region to what is going on on the left and right, it's also comparing the light levels uh, in the central region to what's above and what's below. So we now have this sort of two-dimensional thing to worry about. And what most people come up with is a model whereby there's a central zone uh, where light stimulation excites the cell and a surrounding zone, left, right, up and down, sort of looking like a disc, uh, excuse me, not a disc, an annulus, a donut, sort of looking like a donut, uh, providing inhibition. Uh, so if we were to now record from cat retinal ganglion cells, we might find something like this. Uh, if you do not shine a light on a cat retinal ganglion cell, you can nevertheless record action potentials. And these action potentials are occurring in the absence of any stimulation. So this is sort of resting activity that you find in the absence of any particular stimulation. Now, what we will do is take a little flashlight and provide light stimulation in particular areas of this cell's receptive field. So uh, this particular cell has a receptive field with a center and if we shine light in that central zone, the dark blue, hey, the firing rate has increased. We have a greater rate at which action potentials are fired. 
So this would be an excitatory center, shine light on it and the firing rate increases. Now it turns out that if we were to shine a light on this light blue surrounding donut or annulus, then we will have a reduced rate of action potential firing compared to uh, our resting rate up here. So here's our resting rate with no stimulation. The rate that we observe when we shine a light in the inhibitory surround is less, even fewer action potentials. Finally, if we position our light so it stimulates both the center and the surrounds, if we do that just perfectly, then we'll find that the number of action potentials is unchanged, the rate of firing is unchanged. So what would happen, let me ask you, if we were to shine a light here? Well, in fact, this particular cell is not sensitive to lights that we shine right here. We would say that lights right here lie outside of that cell's receptive field. The receptive field is effectively that area of the visual field where stimulation, light stimulation can make a difference to the cell's firing of action potentials. So we say, yeah, well, shine a light in the center, uh, we excite the cell, shine a light in the surrounds, we inhibit the cell, but if we go outside of that cell's receptive field, we'll have no impact whatsoever. Uh, so a receptive field is that area, in this case, of the visual field where light stimulation can alter uh, the rate of firing. People understand that? Receptive field. Okay. Uh, now it turns out that at daytime light levels, uh, it's not the rods, but rather the cones uh, that are mediating vision. And the retinal ganglion cells and the bipolars are receiving inputs from different kinds of cone. And it turns out that these two will have a <clears throat> spatial organization that compares uh, light levels at adjacent locations and this is a center surrounds receptive field structure. So here we have a very nice uh, picture uh, showing the location of different kinds of cones and it turns out that there are three kinds of cones, long wavelength sensitive, medium wavelength sensitive and short wavelength sensitive cones, L, M and S. And this diagram uh, is effectively showing how you can combine the inputs from different cones to provide a central excitatory region and it's excitatory, that's indicated by the plus sign and surrounding cones are effectively uh, inhibiting the response of that same retinal ganglion cell. And you can see that there is generally a mix of uh, cone inputs uh, in such situations. The L's and the M's uh, might be mixed together when doing such spatial processing. So uh, let's see, a center surround receptive field structure is spatially opponent. The responses at different locations are opposed to one another, so that's opponent. Uh, things like this will enhance edges and you saw our simple model several slides ago where these cells, they don't respond at all to boring nothingness where there's no change, they're interested in change, edges. So, good. It turns out that if you move from the retina uh, up through LGN, you'll come to visual cortex, uh, primary visual cortex, area V1 in particular, and there was a long, long period of time where people had no idea what V1 was doing. And the reason they had no idea what V1 was doing is they had no idea what a good light stimulus for neurons in primary visual cortex would be. And so they were shining like spots, you know, round lights, or they were shining big blobby pictures. They were shining everything but the right kind of stimulus that would get a good response. Hubel and Weasel uh, actually were the people who discovered what kinds of things light up neurons in area V1. And for this and for other work, they got uh, the Nobel Prize. And this is a, a diagram that shows these good visual stimuli and how they work for neurons in area V1. So here we go. Uh, an anesthetized cat has one eye propped open so that we can show lines of different orientation to particular regions of the retina. And it turns out that showing 
bright lines or dark lines of different orientation, that's what gets cells in primary visual cortex excited. And it's Hubel and Wiesel who took advantage of this. So uh, the microelectrode is implanted into visual cortex to monitor single cells firing rates in response to these oriented line stimuli. So here's a horizontally oriented line segment stimulus and it's shown on a screen. Here's this anesthetized cat with one of its eyes open. There's a, a microelectrode that is, has a tip just next to a neuron in primary visual cortex. Uh, you can record the action potentials from that neuron and these need to be amplified. These can then be shown on an oscilloscope or even be used to play little clicks so that when an action potential occurs you hear a click on some loudspeakers. So uh, when the cell fires, the neural responses are amplified and then displayed on an oscilloscope and the procedure is repeated on many different neurons. But the basic idea is that there are uh, some cells fire more rapidly in response to a vertical line and you can see that we have a high rate at which we're firing action potentials. Uh, these same neurons fire at a lesser rate if we show it a tilted line and finally uh, they don't like responding at all to horizontal lines. There is clearly a selectivity, a sensitivity for lines of the right orientation shown by these cells. And the cell that's being diagrammed here likes the vertical orientation for its line segments. It does not like horizontal. There are other cells in visual cortex that are the opposite. They love horizontal line segments. You know, no matter, uh, you know, there's a cell that's looking for a horizontal line segment over here. There's a cell looking there. There's a cell looking there. All these guys like the horizontal line segments no matter uh, where it happens to be positioned but they don't like vertical line segments so they have the opposite sensitivity. In fact, for whatever line orientation you choose, say 45 degrees this way, there will be cells in primary visual cortex that prefer that orientation and they will hate the opposite orientation. So uh, each neuron in visual cortex has a target stimulus that evokes an especially rapid firing rate and in this particular case we're talking about the orientation of line segments. And that's different from the sort of things that you think about for center surround cells. Remember our center surround cells? They have the excitatory center and the inhibitory surrounds. The sort of thing cells like that like are just spots, particularly spots of light right in the excitatory central zone. So that's not the kind of cell we're talking about here. Uh, I should point out that these center surround units I've been talking about as though the center always excites the cell and the surrounding input always inhibits the cell. Turns out uh, that there are also units that are the opposite of this. So that when you shine a light in the central zone, it inhibits the cell. When you shine a light in the surrounding zone, it, ex surrounding zone, it excites the cell. So uh, instead of having plus signs in the middle and minus signs in the surrounds, making this an on center cell. Well, it's the opposite. Minus signs in the middle, uh, plus signs in the surrounds. That would be an off center cell. So that when you shine a light in the central zone of the receptive field, you turn that cell off. That's the opposite of this guy we've been talking about. Okay. There's lots of different cell types and we're just barely touching on them in this course. Sensation and perception. That's the way to learn more about this. Now, uh, we talked about uh, spatial opponency comparing light levels at nearby locations. Uh, I also want to talk about color opponency and comparing light levels at nearby wavelengths. Uh, so we're talking about color vision now. And the first thing is to note is that uh, visual sensations vary in color and from the perceptual point of view, color has three dimensions, hue, red, green, yellow, blue, hue, uh, brightness, how bright a light is, and saturation, how much coloration there is. You can have a very pale or pastel green, but you can also have a very deep, vibrant green that's highly saturated. So there's really three dimensions of color experience 
hue, brightness, and saturation. And it turns out uh, that normal human color vision is trichromatic, reflecting these three dimensions. And the reason normal human color vision is trichromatic is that we have three different kinds of cone. Each kind of cone has a different photopigment, looking at a different region of the visual spectrum. So it turns out that the visual system compares responses from different cone types. It finds the difference in stimulation of these different cones, uh, and that's what leads to color opponency. And uh, this can account for all sorts of perceptual phenomena, including complementary colors, color contrast, and negative afterimages, which I will show right at the very end of this lecture. So the visible spectrum, again, varies from 400 nanometers through 700 nanometers. And if you were to name the colors as you move from right to left in this diagram, then it's going to be red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. This doesn't look very violet. It should look redder. Anyway, the way to memorize the order of the colors in the spectrum is by memorizing that person's name, Roy G. Biv, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. And so if you see a nice rainbow someday, you should be able to identify the order of the colors in the vis uh, visible spectrum. So uh, it turns out that most lights reaching our eyes have energy at all wavelengths. And this can seem complicated, but in fact, it's not so bad. Recall the famous experiment by Newton where he had a beam of white light coming through a hole in the wall and hitting a prism. Uh, and what a prism will do, due to the fact that its surface is at an angle to the incoming light, it will spread out that light according to uh, variation in wavelength. So uh, here's the red end of the spectrum, there's the blue end. And what that effectively shows is that this white light is the sum of lights at all of these different wavelengths. We're decomposing the white light into its constituents when we use a prism. So here's an example. If we ask how much power there is in a standard daylight, uh, as we move from 400 nanometers through 700 nanometers, well, we'll find that there's power at every wavelength. There's more in some wavelengths and less in others, but at every wavelength we are finding some power, some energy. So your standard light stimulus is broadband. The opposite of the standard light stimulus is a monochromatic light stimulus. And these are lights with energy at only a single wavelength. And you, uh, Mark, we are all fortunate enough to have examples of this uh, readily available. Helium neon laser lights, and these are the standard red lasers, they provide energy at a single wavelength, 632.8 nanometers. There's no energy at any other wavelength from that laser except for 632.8. This laser that I'm using is a green laser pointer. It provides energy only at 532 nanometers. So when we have these laser lights, they're monochromatic. They're very different from the normal lights that our visual system deals with. The normal lights that our visual system deals with have energy at all wavelengths, not just one. Now, uh, you're probably worried now, well, if we're having light energy at all wavelengths, how can we possibly account for the color? Somehow we've got to mix the light found at each wavelength in an appropriate way to figure out what the color is. Turns out there are two ways to add uh, colors together, depending upon whether the colors are due to light sources, in which case we are interested in additive color mixture, or whether the lights are due to lights reflected from surfaces, from pigment molecules, say inside of cl uh, clothing. Uh, in which case we are interested in subtractive color mixture. So there are two kinds of color mixture we're interested in. Additive color mixture is what you're talking about when you're combining lights. And let's have three examples, please. One example is you have three slide projectors displaying on a single screen. How many people have ever seen a slide projector? I thought so. These were really common at one point. And basically, you know, there's this little box here and it produces a really nice bright light, typically in a rectangle shape, uh, but you can make it different shapes. And then there's a slide 
And it could be a picture you took on your vacation with a old style camera or something like that. Uh, in any event, you can put a red slide in one slide projector, a green slide in a second projector and a, oops, yeah, green slide and a blue slide in a third slide projector and you can produce red, green and blue lights from those projectors. If you now shine them on a screen like this one here, well, you'll find a phenomenon just like this. The light from the red projector alone looks red. The light from the green projector alone looks green and the light from the blue projector alone looks blue. So far, so good. It makes sense. But now we're going to mix the colors. So this is additive color mixture so that when we have a red light and a blue light present, we end up seeing a brighter sort of purplish light. Remember the light levels are added in such locations and when you add two lights together, you have more light in the area of intersection. So that when we have red and blue adding right in this little area, well we have a brighter purple. Now let's suppose we have our red projector again shining with our green one on. So these two guys will produce yellow if the red and green are chosen properly and that yellow will be brighter than either red or green alone because again the two lights are adding together. So red and green make yellow in this case when you add lights. Finally, what about uh, blue and green projectors on simultaneously? Well, you should get a blue-green brighter light. Again, brighter because you add the lights together. Uh, other examples of additive light mixture provided by a color television set or a computer monitor, something like that. If you look at the uh, surface of your display with the magnifying glass, you'll see these little spots. These are the phosphors and these are uh, molecules that will glow particular colors in response to stimulation. Uh, that's one way to do it at least. Uh, and these are typically uh, red, green and blue. And when you sit back from your television or your computer monitor, the tiny red, green and blue dots effectively blend together. They blur uh, and blend together through that process of blurring because effectively your eye is unable to resolve the very, very close spacing of those dots. So they end up being added, the red and green and blue components. If you go to a theater or something like that, you'll see spotlights. They also add to one another. So uh, subtractive color mixture is what you need to talk about if you're talking about pigments. Uh, so here we have filters. And this is not quite red, but let's uh, pretend it's almost red. And it filters the light. Uh, to provide that red color and I have to ask you a question. How do you suppose a filter works? Well, it actually filters out some wavelengths of light, it diminishes them and it keeps or preserves other wavelengths of light. So if I have a filter and it looks red, which wavelengths are being preserved? The wavelengths that make things look red is the answer. Which wavelengths are being diminished or removed from our light? All the wavelengths that don't look red, in particular the greens, the yellows and the blues. We are subtracting light when we have a filter. Uh, there are pigment molecules inside this filter that effectively will remove certain parts of the spectrum while preserving others. And if we have something that looks vaguely reddish, well, hey, we're preserving the red wavelengths. Yellow. What can we say about this guy? We are removing the reds, the greens and the blues while preserving wavelengths that tend to make things look yellow and that's why this looks yellow. What about blue? We are subtracting away all that energy at wavelengths other than those that appear blue. For instance, uh, those in the middle of the spectrum that typically look green and yellow. So do people get the idea? We're not adding lights anymore when we come to things with pigments. Rather, we are subtracting away lights and asking ourselves what remains. So it turns out uh, if we now have a yellow filter and a blue filter, typically the only region of overlap is going to be a green. And the amount of green light that actually gets through this region of overlap is not going to be very large. So this region of overlap is going to be darker 
That's what I'm trying to get at here. If we have a yellow filter, it removes light. If we have a blue filter, it removes light. If we have a yellow and a blue filter, it removes twice the amount of light. It ends up looking darker. So this is going to be a darker color and in, turn, in fact it looks green uh, because we preserve a little bit amount of the green looking wavelengths with the yellow filter. We preserve a small amount of the green wavelengths with our blue filter and those are the only guys that make it through both of those filters. And we get similar phenomena for these guys. The important thing is that additive and subtractive color mixture are really different from one another. When we add lights, fine. When we subtract light using pigments, uh, you, need, you need to think it through a little bit more uh, carefully. Now, let's suppose we have a light and it has uh, light energy at all wavelengths, so it has complex spectral properties. Uh, you might say, well, how are we going to think about the color appearance of such a light? Uh, it turns out that because we have just three kinds of cone photoreceptor, we can characterize that light by just three numbers. So instead of worrying about a number at each wavelength, we just say there's just three numbers that we need. And it turns out that these three numbers are the responses of the long, medium, and short wavelength sensitive photoreceptors, our three kinds of cone photoreceptors. So uh, this is called trichromacy. And one way to state uh, the fact of trichromacy is that only three distinct lights are needed to reproduce the full gamut of colors. So when you're watching TV, I mean there's browns, there's pinks, there's greens, there's more or less any color you want on your TV set. But when you look at the tiny dots on the front of your TV set, you will see only red, green, and blue. And you have to ask yourself how it is that only three colors can generate the full variety of color experience. Well, it's because, well, we are trichromatic. We respond with only three dimensions to complex visual stimuli. It turns out we need only three primary colors to generate our range of color experience. And what people typically do is choose three lights of very high saturation and differing hue, like a saturated red, a saturated green, and a saturated blue. And if you choose lights of that sort as primaries, you'll be able to generate a wide panoply of different colors. And that's because we are three-dimensional creatures when it comes to color. What are those three dimensions? Well, again, uh, perceptually speaking, there's hue, and you can see how we're going from, uh, it's not a very good red, I, well, I'll call that red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo and violet. Uh, saturation, while well, there's zero saturation on the left side where it's gray and there's much higher saturation on the right side where there's a lot of coloration. It's salmon color. And brightness uh, of lights, the lightness of surfaces or the value, the gray value of something, uh, you can see it varies as well. In this case from black to white. So those are sort of the three dimensions illustrated. And why we have these three dimensions is because we have three kinds of cone photoreceptors and these three kinds are distinguished by the spectral sensitivity of their photopigments. So the three kinds of cones are called L, M, and S. And L, M, and S stand for long wavelength sensitive, medium wavelength sensitive, and short wavelength sensitive. And so what we're plotting here is the sensitivity of these three kinds of cones to lights of different wavelengths. And a long wavelength sensitive cone should be most sensitive to longer wavelengths, less sensitive to shorter. And here is a plot showing the relative sensitivity of an L cone photoreceptor. And we see, yes, it's actually flipping around too much. It actually peaks at this longer wavelength about, uh, I don't know, what's that, 550 or so, 560. Uh, it's hard for me to line it up standing right here. It looks like it even might be even 570. Uh, the mediums, well, you can see that their peak sensitivity, sensitivity is at a wavelength shorter than that found for the long wavelength sensitive cones. So they are sensitive to a shorter uh, middle region of lights. 
Finally, we have the short wavelength sensitive cones. You can see they're very sensitive to lights in the, at the shorter wavelengths uh, that are really good at making things look blue. Uh, it turns out people used to call these the red, the green, and the blue photoreceptors because they had the mistaken idea, and this is a mistake, uh, that when you stimulated an L cone, things looked red. That turns out to be wrong. They had the same idea for M except, well, when you stimulate an M cone, things end up looking green. That's also wrong. Uh, and they also thought that when you stimulate S cones, things end up looking blue. And actually, that one is close to correct, but it's still wrong. Uh, so people used to call these R, G, and B cones. And you might still see that in different locations, but people don't call them that anymore because it's wrong. They call, that long, they call these long, medium, and short wavelength sensitive cones. And you can see that they're sensitive to different regions of the spectrum. So this helps us understand color blindness, by the way. Uh, it turns out that there are people who lack L cones. They have only two kinds of cone photoreceptors, M and S. These people who lack L cones are called protonopes, and they suffer from protonopia. Uh, there are also people who completely lack M cones. And so the only things they've got are L and S cones. Uh, these are called deuteranopes, and they suffer from deuteranopia. Finally, we have the rarer case where people lack S cones. Uh, so they have the L and the M cones, but no S cones, and they're called tritonopes. Uh, it turns out that uh, these are the three kinds of dichromatic color vision, and it's called dichromatic because there are only two classes of cone photoreceptors that are operational. Normal human color vision is trichromatic, L, M, and S. These are cases where somebody is lacking a kind of cone, so they only got two dimensions, and they're dichromats. Uh, it turns out that these are almost always uh, males. And that's also the case for people with anomalous color vision, which is more common. We're talking about red-green uh, color blindness in effect here. So what are the three varieties, well, three major varieties of anomalous color vision? Well, there's protonomaly, where somebody either has a shortage of long wavelength sensitive cones or altered L cone pigment sensitivity. Effectively, their long wavelength sensitive cones are messed up one way or another, but not totally absent. So they're protonomalous. Uh, deuteronomalous people uh, have altered M cones, and tritonomalous people have a shortage of S cones or altered S cone pigments. So these are more common things. It turns out that uh, problems with the L and the M cones are most common among males, and there's a reason for that. Uh, L cone and M cone pigments, namely the opsin proteins that contribute to their pigments, are coded by genes on the X chromosome. So L and M cone pigments coded by genes on the X chromosome. Females have how many X chromosomes? So if they have a problem with L and M cone pigment genes on one of their X chromosomes, you know, there's always a second chromosome on which they may have perfectly functioning copies of those genes. Sorry about that, folks. Uh, we also have males, only one X. If there is a problem with the L or M cone genes uh, on that single X chromosome, well, there's no fallback because there's only the Y. And you don't have L and M coding genes there. So if there is a problem with the L and M cone genes on that single X chromosome, uh, then that will be exhibited phenotypically and the person will have red, green color blindness. Turns out that 8% of males exhibit red, green color blindness of this form where there are L cone or M cone abnormalities. Now it turns out that inheriting an S cone related color div vision deficiency is quite rare. However, there are medical conditions that can kill these, neuron uh, these photoreceptors off. Turns out that the short wavelength sensitive photoreceptors are somehow more sensitive to adverse environmental conditions. For instance, they're absorbing a lot of UV light. So that the first photoreceptoral system that will die if you stare at too much UV light will be your short wavelength sensitive cones. 
Uh, second, diabetes can weaken and kill off S cones. Effectively, you're eliminating one dimension of color vision. Uh, but to inherit an S cone related color vision deficiency is quite rare. Uh, and again, inheriting a color vision deficiency is rare among females simply because they've got two X chromosomes. How do we test for color blindness? Well, there are many ways, but I think people have probably seen these. I had uh, an Ishihara color play test. I think when I was in junior high school, you know, you go to the school nurse and, you know, they want to know how well you hear and they want to see if you can see the numbers here. How many people have seen these guys? Good. Uh, so it looks innocuous to, I think, people with normal trichromatic uh, color vision to say, well, what number is being displayed here on the left? Five. What number is being displayed here on the right? Eight. Yeah, if somebody says three, and something's going on. Effectively, a person with red-green color blindness will respond differently to these stimuli. Uh, is there anybody who's red-green uh, red color blind here? Any of you guys? It's actually more serious than you think. So I have a friend who is pr uh, a protonope, completely lacking L cones. And uh, this is a very good person, but you do not want to get in the passenger seat of a car with this guy driving. And the reason is he cannot tell the difference between a red light and a green light. And that is serious. And ha driving through intersections is like a nightmare. So, uh, you know, such a person really has a, a limitation. Uh, in sensing a wide variety of signaling systems based on color that we use all the time, including traffic lights as a prominent example. Uh, there's a neat web exhibit suggesting how things appear to colorblind people and effectively instead of having uh, sort of a full three-dimensional color experience, you take your picture and you m remove one dimension of color uh, and things are a little bit uh, washed out uh, and different as a result. And discriminations that you and me might find very easy between a red and a green, well, might be very difficult for somebody with red-green color blindness. They will just be various shades of gray. Uh, so, color opponency, oh, let's see what time it is. Let's try to get through some material in six minutes. I'm not certain we will, but let's give it a shot. We're now going to get to the part where we consider neurons that compare the responses of the three kinds of cone photoreceptor. We effectively want to compare the amount of light received at the longer wavelengths to the amount of light received at the middle region of the spectrum or the amount of light at short wavelengths compared to the amount at longer wavelengths, et cetera. We want to compare light levels in different regions of the spectrum. That's what color opponency is all about. So, First thing to note is that there are a number of perceptual uh, phenomena that support the notion that we do compare uh, light levels found in different regions of the spectrum. And so here are some. There appear to be four primary hues, uh, red, green, yellow, and blue. When we talked about trichromacy, we emphasized the importance of primaries on our television set. We said, oh yes. Uh, the red, the green, and the blue, and we're done. But when you think about the way things actually look, most people would agree that you've got to add one more color to the mix if you are going to account for perception. So there's the red, the green, the blue, and the yellow. Nobody really is willing to say that yellow looks the same as red. Yellow doesn't look the same as green. Yellow doesn't look the same as blue. It's its own thing. There's one more color needed. Uh, from the perceptual point of view. One more hue required. So people say that there are four primary hues as far as appearance goes. Red, green, yellow, and blue. Uh, second thing, people have noticed that it's impossible to see certain color pairs at the same time at the same location. So these are uh, pairs are red and green and blue and yellow. So if I look right there, uh, no, any place, if I look any place at any one time, I'm not going to be able to see red and green simultaneously. I will be able to see red and yellow simultaneously and now I am looking at 
sort of an orangish uh, shirt back there. And I can see red inside that. I can also see yellow inside that. So it is possible to sense yellow and red simultaneously. Here I have a purple thing and I am able to sense blue and red simultaneously. There are other color mixtures out there. I see a blue-green thing right there. I can see blue and green simultaneously. You will never be able to point to something and say, I see red and green simultaneously at the same place at the same time. You need to think about that one, but it's more or less true. Uh, it's also true that you will not see at the same time and place blue and yellow. It turns out that these two color pairs are effectively opposites of one another. Blue is the opposite of yellow. You see either the one or the other. Red is the opposite of green. You see either the one or the other. Uh, so good. Finally, there appear to be lights with a unique hue appearance. This is another interesting set of perceptual phenomena. And there is a unique red light. A unique red light, in fact there are many of them. Uh, you can have dim ones or bright ones. Uh, unique red lights appear neither yellowish nor bluish. It's that simple. So if I have a unique red light and I add blue light to it, it starts looking purple. If I have a unique red light and I start adding yellow to it, it starts looking orange. I want a unique red light that is perfectly red with neither the blue nor the yellow. That's unique red. Uh, and then we have similar things for unique green, appears neither yellow nor blue. Unique blue appears neither reddish nor greenish. So if I have unique blue light and I uh, add some uh, red light, it starts looking purple. So that's not unique blue. If I add green light to it, it starts looking blue green. So that's not unique either. I need a perfect blue light, a unique blue that is neither red nor green. So I just want to point out where these guys live approximately in the visible spectrum. Uh, a unique blue is going to be at some wavelength in this region here and you can see if we go to shorter wavelengths we start getting red. If we go to uh, longer wavelengths we start getting green. So a unique blue is sort of that point that divides those two regions of the spectrum. Unique yellow is something similar. It appears neither reddish nor greenish. And it's sort of hard to see in this particular diagram, but if you go to the right to longer wavelengths, it starts looking red, orange, uh, I suppose. And if you go in the other direction, it starts looking green. So unique yellow is that one point where it's neither red nor green. Unique green looks neither yellow nor blue. And here's the weird thing. What about unique red? Unique red appears neither yellowish nor bluish. But it turns out that if you look at lights drawn from different regions of the visible spectrum, you will never find a unique red light. And isn't that bizarre? There is no unique red light available on the visible spectrum. If you go down to the very short wavelengths, you find lights that look violet, which are mixtures of blue and red appearance. If you go to long wavelengths, you will find effectively these reds that are tinged with yellow, in effect orange. So they're imperfect. And what you've got to do to make a unique red light is to add some of this violet light to some of that orangish light and it turns out that the blue and yellow will cancel one another out if you do it perfectly, leaving just red. So what I'm going to do is have about 10 minutes next Tuesday finishing this up and talk about color opponency, uh, how we get all of these phenomena accounted for. Thank you again. Have a good weekend.